We are talking with Andrew Fisk, who is the, the feature screenplay winner for Shapeshifters. He is talking to us from Montreal, but I guess that's via California and Tennessee, right, Andrew? Exactly. Uh, so congratulations on Shapeshifters, a very interesting, I guess, high concept, high budget uh, concept and feature script. Uh, wh what was, uh, first tell people what kind of what the idea is and how you came up with this idea. Well, let's see. Um... I guess the origins go back to a, a vacation that I was on years ago. The island of Martinique, it seemed like a weird beginning, but uh, I was in the jungle with several people going through the rainforest. And when I went back, it was like the kind of thing I might do, I'm going to go on the octopus all day. And the person I was with uh, said to me, you know, you know, Andy, when you were out in the jungle today, you changed right in front of me. And I said, I changed? She said, yes, you look different. You moved very interesting. <laughs> I hadn't expected that. So um, I started you know, reading up on the whole concept of shapeshifters. And there's you know, there are any number of books available. And um, I found that there was a, a, a group of shapeshifters who I mentioned in the screenplay uh, who were part of Slavic legends called the Nuri. And they lived along the Volga River, I believe, in Eastern Europe. And they weren't considered full just sort of a given among the local people for you know, hundreds of years that one or two days of the month they would turn into wolves, okay? And you could stay away from their little camp. And I thought this is amazing because the more I read about it, the more it was accepted. And certainly in Europe for hundred years that there really were such things as shape It wasn't just stories and legends. I mean there'd be some sort of um, uh, attack on a village or or individuals in France or in Central Europe the king would send out knights to see what's going on. They would say, Well, yes, there were a couple of wolves here, but all them so the problems all solved. Yeah. I mean this was this went on for hundreds of years. It didn't stop until sometime in the eighteen hundreds. But you but do you actually believe that that people turn into werewolves? Um, I don't know if I wanted to go that far, but uh, I'm not only to quite go that far, but it is it is part of our, how you might call it, our collective unconscious, because this goes, this kind of idea goes back thousands of years, and it's across, you know, it's about every culture. So there's something that it, that it appeals to the to the, to the human psyche. I can't say that someone can turn into an animal. But, uh, but don't do the, the question I have is that do other animals? Is there like lores of like other animals turning into other animals? Because we are animals, right? So. Well, there are. There are uh, there are animals who turn into who can uh, turn into human beings for a short term. Like in Peru, they have um, uh, these pink river dolphins who are kind of unique because they were they only live in fresh water in the Amazon. They were cut off from the uh, dolphin population. And according to legends in this part of the, in the part of the world in Peru, these animals will turn into something resembling human beings. And on the walk on two legs, they stand upright. They go into town. They drink. They no, because we are like at the same time we're like we're we're we are we're, we're not humans we're animals like that's so it's just kind of funny how like we have this these urban legends I guess of like us turning into animals in a sense yeah um, it's sort of we're sort of uh, what is it civilization and it's discontents I guess that we we're want to in some ways want to be like the animals we want to be uninhibited we will be spontaneous and act according to our natures but at the same time. There's this dark thing about it, and we're afraid of it as well. We find maybe too much sexuality with that. So it's definitely, I think, a two edged sword. Yeah, and the, but there's, I guess there's some similarities about, like, I guess even the actors we were talking about this, like, there's like, I guess there's like some parallels of X Men, I guess, with shapeshifters in a sense. There's like a certain parallel, like, two factions, like, one good, one evil. Like, not to be, I'm just being very generic in that sense. Like, yeah, I mean, that sort of seems to get the trend. You've got X-Men, and you've got Avengers. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe some other things as well. You've had the one, one group of good guys, one group of bad guys. But it's more about the mutant aspect of it, like about like how they are kind of evolving, I guess, as a species. Like they're shapeshifters, that they are, they're above us, above the humans, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they've sort of been around longer, and as we go through, as you go through the movies, these 
it's not all just you know, violence and destruction. What they make, they actually have healing powers. They can heal human beings. They can heal each other. And they have telepathic powers as well for communication. They actually have kind of a, I guess you might call it a religion, perhaps. And ideology, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, an ideology. And the sort of they, they cling very closely to nature. They get to sort of go into go into a, a meditative trance and communicate with the spirit world. It answers to the but shapeshifters have a very strict moral code that you're not supposed to attack human beings. Yeah. Okay, the bad shapeshifters, they don't care about that. So they're ready to go after anything that moves. So but the, the interesting thing about it, just like I was using the X-Men parallel, where it's like, you get where the the perspective of the bad shapeshifters, I guess. Like, we're just human, so what? Like, we're just like any other animal, like, attack us, right? Whatever. You know, you, you, you can look at that, that point of view on things, right? Like, you know what I mean? It's like that's what makes it interesting. Like, because it's like the even though the bad guys are the bad guys, you can still kind of understand their perspective. You can see their anger, I guess. Yeah, and, and there is <clears throat> there is uh, anger towards the humans because as uh, it comes out, the shape shapeshifters kind of have their own uh, place. Some of them have moved to a, a sanctuary, okay, out in the middle of nowhere, where they thought human beings would never find them. And yet, you know, the pollution of the air, the water, the mountain has affected them. You know, their birth rates are dropping. You know, fewer, uh, fewer shapeshifters were born to make it into adulthood. So they're they're questioning their, even the good ones are questioning their own survival. You know, they can't really have a, a war with uh, the human race. I mean, they're vastly out. But they're, 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 is, um, they're trying to maintain their morality, but they're kind of resentful. So how long did this, like, like screen, screen flight take? Because there's a lot, like, we're, as we're talking, there's a lot going on, and it's, and it's for, like, as I, as I pitched at the beginning, like, it is a high concept, high budget feature script, right? So there's certain things that you have to do to order to, like, to appeal to the mass audience, I guess, as well, right? Yeah, I mean, this, you know, I didn't sit down and do this in one shot. Yeah, of course. <laughs> this is not the little riding Rocky in three days, you know. Uh, uh, I did, uh... <laughs> Which is not true, anyway, so what? <laughs> but, um, you know, I had to, um, you know, I had to put this through a lot of rewrites. I mean, the last few months, this has been pretty much, this is front on the front burner. It's been my main project, you know, getting, making it, it's going through it again and again, making it better, finding what the work and tripping it out and putting in something new. So I don't know, it's, um, it's what, you gotta, you gotta have the main character and I think Sarah Bennett is. And she's, uh, you, you could even call, we call her a, a feminist icon, you know, sort of like a 30 year old uh, doctor. She's had a lot of problems in her life because she's a shapeshifter who was yeah. born in the nation and she doesn't even know it. You know, the reason for the bad dreams and the depression and the nervous breakdown is she is not uh, in, uh, in her full power yet. Was that character always a female? Uh, yes. It was always a female? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that changes everything in a way, because it's like, this is a female, like, she's the driving force of this film. Like, she's like, she's the, like you said, she's the, the protagonist. She's like, she drives the film, that character. Right, right. Um, yeah, she always was. And, um, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't want the, 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 the male leader of the good shapeshifters, um, Marius, like, take over and give her too much help, but he has to give her something because she's walking into this world that like one could expect. You know, he saves her life once or twice and helps her go through that transformation, but I said, I've got to keep her, you know, keep her uh, driving. You don't want her to be the damsel of distress. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's, and that's the danger of this, of this script. Like, it's the danger of, like, her being saved a little too many times and not kind of being her own woman, I guess. Yeah. So, um... It's just hopefully after she, you know, goes through the first transformation and realizes what she can do, joins um, good shapeshifters in fighting back against the bad ones, and uh, the human hunter, uh, Walsh, that, uh, that she sort of uh, proves herself and um, establishes her, her own identity and power. So are you, like, this, even the way you just, even the way you're talking in, in this interview is, like, you're, like, it's, you're, it's, like, really inside of you. This script seems to be very much still inside of you. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, I had a number of scripts that I was looking at that they're in there, they could be, you know, go for one more rewrite, and this thing just sort of took hold of me, and I couldn't exactly explain why, I just, I, I find, you know, the, the character's interesting, the whole idea of shape-shifting interesting, you know, because it's, you know, like I say, it's part of our human tradition, our collective unconscious, and I like the, 
I like the villain Andreas, uh, who's a very powerful creature, but has a kind of weird humor to go along with it. Like, you wonder, well, okay, uh, his name is his spelled A N D R E A S. I'm A N D R E A S. Like, am I, I, mean, am I identifying with him? Like, uh, yeah, probably a little bit. But do you, like, are you, like, can you step outside and, like, and, like, can you step outside of this script and, like, basically see it for what it is without, like, you know what I mean? Like, where you, like, really give it, you give it away and, like, and then you can see it as, as just an identity that doesn't, like, you don't belong to it anymore, if that makes any sense to you. Like, you've let it go in a sense. Um, no, I don't, I don't think I really can. I mean, you mean if, you mean if I were to tell it, don't give it to someone tell it to you? Something like that, yeah, like in that vernacular, like, you, like, are you able to do that? Well, I mean, I could, I could. I could tell it to someone to produce, but I even if I went to the opening, it would just rain would be locked onto this thing that they didn't change anything. And Which you know that they will, right? Like obviously. Yeah, and just feeling so much emotion with the characters yeah. and, and the and the imagery, you know. So I couldn't completely it. no, it just it really is quite a part of one of my sites. Yeah, no, you can tell. Like that's what I was asking. Like it's just like it's sometimes it's part of like writing a script. You're, like you just have to like you have to get, you have to like let it go in a sense. You have to like like give it away, give it to somebody else, and, and you know what I mean. And and sometimes it's easier said than done. Well, I hope they wouldn't make any changes without asking me to do it. So, What's that? I hope they wouldn't make any changes without asking me to do it. Well, you you know, in, the, in this world, in this business, that doesn't exist, right? Like that doesn't happen, unfortunately, right? So. No, but you know what I'm saying? Like a high concept, like this is like their 40 writers will will tackle this script. You know what I mean? Like it's sort of how it works in a sense, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know things like that happen. I'm just hoping for the best. Well, no, congr- congratulations. And uh, like you got, like this is like, like I said, like high concept. Like I was, when I was like, we were doing the, the reading, it was like, these are like high concept scripts are like, these are tough bags. These are like really tough things to uh, pull off. Because you need to like you need to like you because you're 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 basically giving us a you're like you have to give us an exhibition on a world on this world you're creating this world that we don't know about so you got to tell us this world plus you got to entertain us and plus you got to throw in those concepts that kind of keep to the the average audience member like to basically be entertained like there's certain conventions that you know what I'm saying like it's like there's a lot going on there's a lot there's a lot happening yeah yeah I mean I would I think that. Uh, I don't think you can really say there's any slack time in this. Yeah. You know, I think of a lot of Hollywood movies I've seen in the last ten years. It's like, okay, here's 10, 15 minutes of filler. So, uh, this, I don't think you there's any filler in slack time. Like, it's always moving and always like, kind of wild with the imagery or the shape shifters. In your, in your, uh, just a, like, just a quick segue, like, to finish stuff, like, I, I love your, the, in your love of questions, and where it asks what you're, what the movie you've seen the most in your life, and <laughs> you make a great line, you say, like, Forrest Gump, like, just crosses the tape slightly ahead of Blade Runner. Why do you think you've seen Forrest Gump more often than any other film? You know, as much as I hate to admit it, when it first came out, it hit the theater. Yeah. I didn't see it, I didn't see it until years later on, on DVD, and I, uh, I don't know, maybe it's because he's from the South, and, and I was born out there, and he just feels good, and he just, um, like I say, like that's a, in my question, he's, it's, the, it's sort of like uh, the movie Being There with Peter Sellers, yeah. the triumph of the simple man, the innocent, yeah. you know, it's, it's the one who's, you know, honest and straightforward and trying to do good, and who, uh, who triumphs over the people who are just backstabber and liars and trying to trip him up. Uh, yeah, there, there's, there's something very idealistic about, about Forrest Gump that kind of resonates. Even to me when I first saw it, like, it was like, yeah, if only like, life could be like that, in a sense, right? Like, the less you think, the better you are. Yeah, and it just, you know, the way everything kind of connects together and it kind of mystical sense to go with Forrest Gump, you know, the feather blowing in the wind and he takes his son to a uh, bus stop in the morning the way he used to do it. It's yeah, the ending of the film, yeah. Yeah, it just really kind of connects that way. It's like if you, you uh, end where you start, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, it's like my, my book in this when uh, you know, Marius, I don't think you would give it away too much, but Marius starts the movie with, uh, you know, if you knew who we really are, you hate us and fear us, and they're generous. At the end of the movie, uh, Sarah says the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's sort of, in a sense, it's kind of bookended by, by, by the leader.
Congratulations again! It was it was fun doing it, and, uh, and you like you, like you built like you said like in your questions you've only been writing for six years, and like it says it seems like forever, but it really hasn't. It's been it hasn't been very long, and like usually what they say is that as soon as you get to the, the double digits, it's like that's when you start really uh, that's when you start really moving. So basically, it seems like you're a little bit ahead of yourself in a sense. Okay, I guess. Yeah, though, because the more you do, the the better you. But the more you do it, the better you you get at it, right? So that's like it's bad for anything, I guess, right? Ten thousand hours of practice. Yeah, that's like what the Malcolm Gladwell way or something. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the outlier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's he's right. And it's true. Uh, all right, Andrew, it was it was great. Uh, it was great talking with you. Uh, have fun in Montreal. Uh, and uh, welcome, Ken. Welcome to Canada. All right. All right. Thank you so much.